Mr. Wills? Do you think I'm a certifiable, demented, lunatic, unbalanced killer? Well, Miss Charlotte, that is the big question. Now, I've entertained many theories over the years that you've taken his taxidermic head and kept it under the bed, or you exhumed Big Daddy's body and put Mr. Mayhem in his place. Oh. When I was a kid, I used to watch all the Southern preachers on television, you know, and their wives with the big blonde hair and the blue eye shadow, and they're all crying. <laughs> and all their husbands are really mad. All the gay people are going to hell. You're all going to H-E double toothpicks hell. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if all the gay people are going to hell, <laughs> where else would I want to go? <laughs> what am I going to do, go to heaven with all the straight people wearing white after Labor Day? <laughs> Jason, thank you very much for uh, being here to chat today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for asking me. I was talking to the, the producer of this, David Milburn, before we started, and I was saying that I so appreciate you guys asking me. And he said, well, you've earned this. This is, you know, this is important. And I said you know, to him, yeah, but people don't always remember. So it's nice to be remembered and, and to be thought of. That's important to me. Well, we genuinely... As I get older. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> you are a prolific actor. You've had more than a hundred parts that I could identify and there may be more. Uh, you're a humorist and very, very revered gay activist. You've done a couple of things uh, that have been fun for us because they've appeared on here. Yeah, I mean, if the, the, I think uh, in the, I think when I was 2006 or 7, I taped my first TV special and I wanted to do a TV special that was not like in a theater. I wanted it to be in a nightclub and to be what I did and how, watch the experience of being a comic on the road and being openly gay and being in the middle of my career, in the middle of my life, in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. And I've known David Milburn forever and, I, and Paul and Collishman and I said, hey, you know, come and see my stand-up. You haven't seen it in a long time. They came to the improv, saw us set, and I said, I got this special that I'm almost done. Do you want to look at it? And they looked at it, and they loved it. They put it on TV. It was on Tier TV here in America, and it also in Canada on, I think it's called Pride TV. Out, out TV. Out TV. Yeah, it, wasn't, it, it was called Pride. It, years and years and years ago. Oh, God, it I was, can't believe it, I remember that. It was Pride. Now it's called Pride out, Vision or Pride TV. Out TV, yeah. And now it's Out TV. And it was and, sort and of we, a, we own part of that as well. It was sort of a seminal yeah. thing for my career because it was sort of a, you know, a representative of what I had done to that point. Mm -hmm. And of, of my act that I'd worked on for, you know, 15 years. And that's why I called it Make It to, to the Middle. And it's not just my stand-up, it's also interviews with me and what it's like to be on the road and how unglamorous it really is and the stupid questions you get asked by the radio DJs and the, and the nightclub owners, you know, the, he drove me in his car with his kid stuff in the back and, you know, there's no limousines, there's no, you know, right. you rent a car and you, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not what people think it is, you know, to the middle. And it was quite a big deal. And uh, it played at a couple film festivals and, and well, did it, very it, well. On it's your TV. very funny and yeah. poignant in places. It, it, it's, it's really Is a it? nice... I don't remember. It's a, I kind of haven't seen it in so long. I, I, I found it that The way. stuff about my mom when I talk. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it's kind of touching uh, as well as being hysterical. My dad, when I first came out, it didn't matter to him. So what? Next. You know, he didn't think it was going to be any big deal. And then as I started experimenting with being out and experimenting with talking about it, and he, he used to say, does everything have to be gay? Do you have to talk about gay all the time? You did uh, an important bit, but a short bit for us in The Pit and the Pendulum. I, yeah, I saw in the variety that you guys were buying all these uh, films that were, uh, I guess, uh, what do you call them, national... Uh, uh, what do they call You know, when you can just buy a film that's, that's an old book, well, and you were doing The Pit and the Pendulum. Old ones are called Public Domain. Public Domain, yes. And we, we were doing a series of Edgar Allan Poe yes. adaptations. And I called, uh, uh, I sent an email to David Dakota, and I said, hey, I'd love to work with you. Is there anything? And he said, oh, there's really nothing. Everybody's so young in all these movies. I said, okay. I said, maybe there might be something. Let's go to lunch. I'm, we've never met. So I went to lunch with him, and he said, do you mind looking unattractive? I said, I don't care if it's a great part. He said, but you'd be right to play the Vincent Price role in this Pit in the Pendulum. And then I saw the dialogue. I want to tell you, if I auditioned for this, I never would have gotten it because I didn't understand it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, w I barely graduated high school. I'm this close to insane. 
<laughs> so I'm reading it. I'm going, God, this is like poetry. How am I going to do this? And I was like scared. <laughs> so I spent a whole week working on it, thinking, how am I going to do this? And all of a sudden, you know, and the characters tick tock, tick tock, back and forth, it swings. So I said, I'm going to do my impression of Anthony Hopkins meets Judy Dench. <laughs> <laughs> So I just did this and I went in for the wardrobe fitting and I said, would it be okay if I did in British? And David looked at me like I was insane, like he made a mistake and he, want, he thought, why am I doing this with this guy? Oh God, this stupid, crazy comedian. And then I did it and he said he loved it and we did it. And I went to this really weird place when I did it. Tick tock, back and forth, it swings. It is our consciousness of time that wakes us. From darkness, from dreams, it's the return to life, of slumber. It was like, it was so focused. Like you can tell when the set sort of goes, you know. And all of a sudden, everybody acted like weird around me. And then, then I, you know, because I only worked one day on it. It was fun. Tell me about uh, the guest house, a movie well, you did. That's an interesting thing. It's uh, I play uh, uh, manager again of uh, a golf company. I couldn't be more straight in this. I talk like this and, you know, I'm just this guy. I'm basically my brother, you know, who's been mad at me since 1973 when Barbara Streisand lost the Oscar to Glenda Jackson. Um, but I remember going on the set the first day and I, ha and I uh, saw the producer and he says, God, we Googled you. You're like the king of the gays. We had no idea you were, str you were gay, straight. I'm not straight, I swear <laughs> to God. Uh, he said, we had no idea. And I thought, that was, that's new. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So they just hired me because they liked my reading. And that d happened last year. And that's starting to happen. Now, you also did a, a, a TV part on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, how, did, how did that come about? Well, that's sort of weird because I don't get to play those parts. Those are called what I call, it's not, not necessarily straight guy, straight guy, but very conservative guy. I played an auctioneer who's auctioning off all their stuff and I'm basically commenting on all of them. And uh, Wendy O'Brien, the cast director, uh, cast me in that and this other gal who was her associate. And I thought, I'm not going to get this because I don't usually get those parts. Mm -hmm. If there's somebody, and he was, and I thought that was sort of neat. And it's become this, I did it three years ago, but it's become this um, phenomenon, this show. Because everybody, I get tons of emails about that. That show and Charmed. Charm people are obsessed all over the world, like in France and Germany and, and Middle Eastern people. I get a lot of emails from them. They love, I don't know this, maybe it's the witches or whatever they are, or the, you know, the cute girls, and I'm sure their tops fall off at some point. Or. Not, compl <laughs> not completely. It, the TV fall off. You know, Do they? Is that? Yeah, enough to uh, challenge people, make it interesting, I guess. That's cool. Let's start at the beginning. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in the Bronx in New York okay. and uh, when I was nine months old my father had gotten a job uh, in Los Angeles so we took our Chevy and we drove across country. I was very short so I didn't have a choice. <laughs> I would have chosen to stay a little longer so I could get to Broadway or something but they decided to move and we moved across country and I grew up in an area in Los Angeles that was all full of Russian Polish Jews and all uh, with New Yorkers. So I spoke with a New York accent until I was five years old, until I went to school. I talk like this because I didn't know. We were all, it's very much of a familiar family. We were all together, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, we all lived on the same block. And uh, we lived there for around five years on Guthrie Avenue until everybody tried to kill each other. <laughs> and then uh, we moved into this big house on Maryland Drive. And that's when my mother started having sex with the butcher. Go ahead. <laughs> What part of town did you move to originally? Uh, we, we moved in the, I guess it was that like... That you had the neighborhood feel? Uh, I was and... off the uh, 10 freeway near La Cienica. Okay. And then we moved to the Fairfax area. Alrighty. You know, where all the Jews lived, you know. And uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Older brother, younger sister. My okay. father uh, is a Holocaust survivor. Not the camps, the ghettos. Hmm. And uh, he's sort of an extraordinary guy. He passed away last year. He was, he is the American dream. He came here without being able to speak English. And because of him, I was able to become an artist, you know, because I was able to become who I was because he gave me the opportunities, you know, because I, I don't think I would have been able to with another kind of family. And my mom has given me humor and uh, sexiness, and uh, she's the funniest person that ever lived. And I don't think I would have become a stand-up comic if it weren't for my mother. So she was a character oh, from the early days. Oh, was, going. is. <laughs> she lives in Palm Springs. 
Of course. You know, and all of a sudden the pharmacist is always looking at her boobs, you know. <laughs> she's 76 and she, she still thinks people are coming on to her. But yet they are, because they're older than her. She's young for Palm Springs. Yes. <laughs> so you started out with two parents who were really influential on you and, and interesting. Oh, yeah, in a lot of ways, you know, uh, very much so. They're very much, my parents are very much who I am as a person in the beginning of my life and as an adult. I, I, uh, I have incredible uh, respect and, and forgiveness to both of them. They were very, very young when I was born. So we sort of all grew up together. What were you like as a child? Um, on the outside, I think I was a really funny kid. And on the inside, I was probably really sad. You know, I always say that when you're a kid and you're in the closet, what it is is being locked in the closet. What, what, is that, what does that really mean? I mean, you're standing on the shoes. You're behind a leather jacket. There's hat boxes and shit in the way. Right. Every once in a while, someone opens the door, turns on a light, flashes it in your eyes, takes something out, and then shuts the door really fast. And that's how you make all your decisions. You know, you're like a plant growing up in the dark. And that's the way, that's the way I think of myself. So I always think that I'm sort of um, catching up in life. I'm always sort of catching up to people because there's certain things I just never experienced until I got older. At what point in your life did you begin to realize that you were gay? Was it pretty early or later on? Well, that's a question that straight people always ask you. And I always say it back to them is, when did you know you were straight? I never knew I wasn't gay. Okay. I remember the day I found out I wasn't you know, straight. I remember that. That I knew for sure that I wasn't straight. It was, uh, I was coming home on the bus from Westside Jewish Center camp. Um, Michael Jackson was playing The Love You Save on my transistor radio. And all the kids were pairing up. And I remember sitting on the bus looking around going, oh God, well that's not going to be me. I better find a girlfriend. And that's when I started pursuing Amanda Shearer, who is still my friend. And that was my first girlfriend. And I remember thinking, I have to find, I mean, I was like 12, and I thought, I have to find a girlfriend. Sure. To marry. That's how crazy I was. Well, but uh, that was the world then. And, yeah, it was very different. Yeah, very different. And you say you were sad. Were you sad oh, about... Oh, very sad kid, I think. And just with respect to sexuality or with respect to I think to I was just a sad kid because I was physically abused, mentally abused in school. It was really awful. And I, and I, uh, I, I didn't start talking about this until I was in my uh, early 30s. Uh, and I talk about it in, when I speak at schools sometimes. Um, when I was in the seventh grade in school in Los Angeles, you're given a locker. And on the locker, uh, some kids scraped really lightly with a nail, the word fag. And I looked at that for three years and I never told anybody. Mm. And I think that changed my life. It changed the way I felt about myself. And I think that people don't realize how bad bullying is and what it does to people because it's, 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 it's always a first thought with me. Um, when someone treats me a certain way, it's, it's, it sticks with you. It's, it doesn't hold me, it doesn't, it's not in me now, but it, mm -hmm. it is a first thought. So I have to go, okay, that's a first thought, in one ear, out the other. You know, it, uh, I was one of those kids that just wasn't included. And because I was different, uh, you know, I paid the price. And Facebook has uh, created a tremendous amount of apologies from people. It not that interesting? Because I was in um, yes. Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I was in Arizona, and there were these two girls that tortured me that f sought me out and apologized to me. And it was sort of weird, you know, because of so many years, and they, they felt more worse than I did. It was more the, um, it wasn't them specifically or the person, it was the uh, choices that I made because of it, and how I shut down, and how I... Uh, sort of led my life. People all think of me a certain way, and it's it's really not who I am. I'm a very private person, and I'm oh, it's it's funny. I didn't think I'd be talking about all this, but it's uh, it, it was a difficult childhood. Put it that way. It, it sounds yeah. that way. Yeah, it was a very difficult childhood. And how did you evolve from a person who was quiet, sad inside? Inside, to, to the comedian. Well, that's how to I protected an, myself. Inter, to an entertainer. I saw a funny girl, like everyone, every other gay kid did. Saw someone that was funny on the outside, you know, uh, sad on the inside. And it was just like me. The fact that she was a woman was very confusing, certainly. Sure. And then Rhoda came on TV, and she was a Jew. And, both, and Streisand and Valerie Harper were both playing Jewish characters, and one was actually Jewish. So I thought, these are people that I grew up with. I understood this. 
And then you grow up and you think as a gay man or as a gay person that if you're in love with Robert Redford, who are you left to be but Barbara Streisand? So you don't get to create the masculinity with you. And I think it took me till I was in my late 30s, uh, 40, to sort of embrace my masculinity and to become, uh, you know, sort of loving it as I, you know, mm -hmm. became a part of the leather community a little and a little bit sure. of the, the, what I call the man's community. And it's something that's more interesting to me. And I think as a kid, I was sort of forced into playing a certain part or being a certain place because there was nothing for you on television. We didn't exist, you know. Uh, we didn't exist in so many ways. And now, you know, over 40, we don't exist. So it, there's always a, a challenge, you know, a, as an actor or as a, as a, just as a human being to say, oh, we, we're here, you know. And I hope that I can do that in some way as an actor because I really think that uh, service is a big part of my life. And it's important to me that everything that I do means something no matter what it is, whether it makes someone laugh or it, just by showing up and being who you are. I, uh, seven years ago, um, I started, created with Duncan Crabtree Island, who's the head legal counsel at Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, the first LGBT committee ever in the United States. And we've been doing this for seven years. This uh, is for SAG after. SAG after. A couple of years later, Tracy Godfrey in New York became the co-chair. I'm, I'm, I'm the current national co-chair with her. And we've been doing all this stuff to support openly gay actors. Because as I said to you in the beginning, it's really important to me for uh, us to support each other. And I remember going to Outfest a lot. And that's where I met a lot of out actors. And everybody was sort of scared. and. You know, and wasn't sure whether they should, you know, say they were gay, and how do you, sure. and also how do you maneuver yourself? Where is the safe harbor, harbor rather? Where is yes. the place that you can feel supported uh, and make a call? You know, and maybe someone starting out in their career deciding whether they should or shouldn't. And a couple of years ago, we started uh, working with the Williams Institute at UCLA, doing the first survey on out actors. And in the fall, at the national meeting at the Screen Actors Guild after the first one ever, they are going to give the results of this survey. So we are going to be a large part of this national union uh, talking about openly gay actors, and I'm a part of that. And, you know, for me, as a gay man, to have my name involved in that as, it means something to me. Because yeah. I, I think that there, there, you know, there's so many actors who are in my age group that, God, you know, have wrestled with this for so many years. Yes. Such fear, you know, of, of not being able to work. You know, and I always think there's three groups of people. There's people that love gay people. There's people that hate us. And there's people that don't care. You know, and I always want to concentrate on those two other groups. Because the people that don't like you aren't going to like you no matter what. That's correct. You know, if they don't like you, they're not going to like you. They're looking for something. Yeah. And to concentrate on the people that do. And, uh, you know, the last couple films that I've done are with these directors under 30, and they don't care whether I'm gay. They just care whether you can do the part. Well, uh, there is a little bit of a groundswell occurring, and work like this and a, an appointment like this plays a part in all that, of articulating uh, how people should be treated in, in a certain profession. Well, advocate, out, here, TV, logo, all these things that have happened in the Bravo, all these things that have happened in the last 10 years have, you know, perpetuated Will and Grace, the, the image of uh, us being present. Now we have to mold it. And now yes. we have to start supporting each other, you know. Uh, we have to start supporting each other's work. And now, and this is something I'm going to say, and it's probably going to be, you know, not loved by everybody, is I think it's time for gay men to start supporting each other. Now, I love Margaret Cho, I love Kathy Griffin, I love Madonna, You talk, I talked about Barbara 25 times already. You know, <laughs> um, I love them all, but I think that we have to start speaking for ourselves. We can no longer stand behind the skirts of women and let them speak for us. We have to do that, you know. Uh, it's very important that our voices are heard, that we're there, because we're changing. You know, we will never move to the next level yeah. as gay men if we don't stand up for ourselves and speak for ourselves and let our voice be heard. And uh, the Screen Actors Guild uh, sent me to uh, Ohio to speak and be a part of Pride at Work. Now, if you don't know what Pride at Work is, Pride at Work is this organization of blue-collar you know, workers who are gay. 
you know, whether they be telephone operators or flight attendants or things that I don't understand that have to do with math or pipes or things. Sure. So I didn't know. I thought I'm going to go and it's going to be fun. I might meet some hot guy. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to go. I'm going to be on a panel. I'm going to go introduce a pool party. I'm just going to go and go. And I'm going to be there for three days. Whatever happens, happens. So I get there and these people are just like so supportive and so wonderful and are so kind. And I'm asked to speak at this uh, panel on uh, out people who are in uh, different forms. I think there was one that was with flight attendants, one lesbian that was with the, the tool fitters or the thing, and then one electricians. And I'm over here just an actor, you know, and a comedian. I didn't know what to do. So thank God I was the um, uh, fourth person to speak because I thought that we were just going to be answering questions and then they just changed at the last minute because they're not show business people. They don't have a set show. So I'm sitting here going and I hear all these people talking and I think, what am I going to say that's going to mean something? And as the thing happens and as people talk about their experiences and being fired and, and being treated a certain way because they're gay and I, I had such a, a moment for myself because I, being a gay actor and comedian, I have let myself be treated anyway at a lot of times because I wanted the job and it's so hard to get the job and I would go in and try to maneuver in it. And I just went on stage and I started to talk about the times that I'd been fired. And I've never done that publicly, ever, because you don't want to speak about things that are negative. And I talked about the time two years ago that I was fired from working in a casino before I got the job because they found out I was gay and they didn't want me. The guy didn't even know who I was. Mm. I talked about the sitcom that I was fired on, that I uh, was hired as a guest star, and that one producer you know, got a bug up his butt that he didn't want a, a gay person playing this role. And it was a gay character on the show. It was the manager of a you know, clothing store. And they decided they didn't want it. They never asked me to play it a different way. All the top gay guys, I mean, I was literally up against that part of Patrick Bristow, Alec Mappa, and Rip Taylor. <laughs> and me, were, I think there was a couple others, I can't remember. I think even Leslie Jordan was there. Mm, and sure. I was fired after two days because they didn't want a gay person to play the role. They changed their mind and they didn't want to argue. I found out later from the director and from one of the stars of the show, who was a friend of mine, who was the only person that called me and said it wasn't, you know, because I thought, what did I do? You yes. Know? And that changes you as a person. And I mean, one of the first jobs I was fired at was in uh, uh, Texas. I was doing, a, in Amarillo, Texas, I was an opening act and I was doing the show and I was doing okay. And this guy calls me in my hotel room and says, we're gonna have to let you go. I said, well, why? She said, well, there's some people here that wanna kill you. Mm. You know, and- My goodness. Oh yeah, and I, I was in Des Moines, Iowa. I was working for this guy and I was selling out and the guy did not like me, who, who was, uh, we kept butting heads. And on the last, you, you, in those days you do six to eight shows in the week, and, and Sunday night was the last show. And he caught, when I came to the club on Sunday, when they picked me up and brought me there, he said, here's your check, we're not doing the show tonight. And he pre, uh, you know, pre, uh, I can't even talk, because it upsets me so much, but it was a terrible time. And he grabbed my arm, did give me a ride home. I had to figure out how to get home myself. I had to figure out how to get my flight back. And uh, I never said anything to people because I didn't want people to know. Of course. You know, you didn't want negative things around you because everybody talked. And I, you know, I was saying to your producer, Quentin Lee, I was the first openly gay comic to headline mainstream comedy clubs on a regular basis, not for a gay night, not just once in a while, but for years. And did that. And Bob Smith, who came before me, always says, you know, don't say that because I, he did these great gay nights and he would do funny gay males, but I actually did it differently. Dating is I was dating a younger guy this year, Hispanic. Are there any Hispanic boys in the house? Yeah. Uh, love you boys, you know. He didn't call me daddy, he called me puppy. <laughs> had one of those chains that went from the belt loop to the wall to the couch because I won't let him leave the house. <laughs> I had it in my head that I wanted to headline in the mainstream, you know, and do that. And uh, I was the first one who was, I guess, uh, a really big success at it in terms of selling tickets and selling out and, and having this time. And it caused some competition, I think, within, within, uh, in the gay comic area too. Mm -hmm. But I gotta tell you, if it wasn't for Jaffe Cohen and, and Bob Smith and 
Bruce Valanche and Michael Greer and you know all these um, Robin Tyler, Leah Delaria, Kay Clint. If I'm missing names, I'm so sorry. But some people that really broke the ground so I can be here. And I get emotional about this because if it weren't for those people, I wouldn't be here. And there's so many more because you stand on the shoulders of these other people. Yes. To get to be where you are, you know. And it's, it's really important to me that people are not forgotten. You know, that we don't erase people's names for what they've done. Like Charles Pierce, who was, I saw him way, a little time before he died, and he, he was, you know, you'd see, people would say he was a drag performer, and, but he was also this extraordinary comedian. I mean, so funny. Laugh out loud, you know, funny. You know, and there's so many great drag, you know, Jackie Bede and Coco Peru and, you know, uh, so many. You know, exactly right. And, you know, one of the reasons I really enjoy having these kinds of conversations, and unfortunately, there were people who I wanted to talk to who are now gone. Yeah. And I need to catch them <laughs> before well, you need they a record. Are, they're That's on their a, way, because we do, we do need a record. And um, the I am fascinated by gay history and by the courageous people, both in and out, who dealt with this for so long. You, know, you don't going realize back history. it. You just don't realize it until, that you're a part of something until you, when you, until you get older. You just want to work so bad. You're an artist and you want to yes. create and you want to have fun and you want to work with talented people. And, and uh, I guess the thing that when we was talking before to, uh, to David and everything about this and what to talk about and what to say, you know, there's just, there's so much that you have to go through to get where you are. There's so much, you know, there's such perception yeah. on who you are. It's interesting, Jason, because, you know, you've talked about, you know, how tough it was to be a child and growing up and how tough it was to break into the business and that is certainly... Well, they didn't want me. I mean, I got there, I could feel it. I, I, remember, I, I remember Joyce Selznick, I walked into her office and she was, she was like, uh, you know, Meryl Streep in The Devil Was Parada. She, she's sitting there, she goes like this, she goes, no, not right. I remember Thank she you. said, and I, she didn't say anything. Yeah. And I just stood there. I no was like courtesy. 19. No. I was 19, and I walked, I'm, I'm, hand to God, I walked into a closet. I, I went into the wrong door. <laughs> and I stood there, she said, Jason, come out of the closet. <laughs> Well, there's certain humor to that. Maybe she didn't but, say that, but it is a funny but, story. But, but I did walk into the closet, and I, I had to get out. She said, "What? You know, maybe she said, come out of the closet.' I don't know." But it was so that you know, I remember walking into auditions when I was in my early twenties, and I remember feeling like their hand was in front of my face. Yeah. Because I remember them making a decision the minute I walked into a room. You know, I wasn't an, an artist. I was in the beginning. I wasn't. I wasn't. I only knew who I was. I only knew that, you know, who I was at that moment. Like I mentor a kid, this young kid named Paul Lai. He's good looking, he's young, and he reminds me so much of me. He's a straight kid. And he reminds me so much of me when I was a kid because he got so much energy. And, you know, and you, he doesn't have developed everything about himself yet because he's only 25. Yes. So you don't know that, hey, when you want to play a different character, you lower your voice like this, or you change the way sure. you sit, or you move, or you're a different person. And, you know, if you're playing someone else, you might want to do something a little different like that. You know, or whatever it is you're doing, you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to change your, your physical body, who you are. You know, they don't realize that yet so much because they haven't had life experience. And when I walked into those rooms, I remember there's a famous quote that Laurence Olivier said in his book, and I'm probably paraphrasing it. He said, the worst thing to do is to show up, show people who you are and for them not to see it. And that's the way I felt for so many years. Yes. That I wasn't seen. You know. Yeah, but um, that has been your journey. Oh, that yeah. That has been the path. But today, you may still feel some of those residual emotions and fears, as we all do. Just every other Thursday. Well, that's it. And otherwise, it's that's just not great. Bad. But you carry yourself now with confidence and as a man and heroically. 
I mean, you do not strike people as a person who is running scared or frightened. And you deserve a great deal of credit and compliment for doing that because you really carry yourself like a heroic person. And we Would you can, call my brother and tell him this? <laughs> I, uh, I'll be pleased to. I, His name's I, Stephen. He's a little mad when he'll call. He'll sound mad, but he's really not. But I'm a Stephen, too, so <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll be okay. He's an EV, so the, I think the pHs are nicer. <laughs> well, being the person you were as a young person and being gay and being Jewish, it appears that you've turned that into empathy for others and an interest in others because a comedian uh, or a humorist is an observer of human behavior. And, but and my show's all about me. <laughs> it's all about, I was never able to do the stuff that's outside myself as well. That wasn't my style as much. I, I guess I love the Don But Rickles. you're observing you then. Yeah, so I've, it was all about me and my family and my life. And I'm sort of, uh, the Don Rickles, Joan Rivers, those were my favorites. And that's how I sort of emulated, emulated my career and those people like that. As an actor, you can play different people. And I've always been comfortable doing that. Yes. Somebody said to me at an audition, I said, well, how do you see this part play? They said, just be yourself. I said, honey, if I knew who I was, I wouldn't be here. I'd have right. a real job and a real life. And I wouldn't be asking you for work at this late age. You know, I'd have a career. But um, I, I, this is just a part of who I am. As you began... Um to think that you could become an entertainer and start. Oh, I never it. began to think that I've always. It was like in my head from day one. Okay. I used to call it Laserhead. I was like Tom Cruise. I used to see myself sort of like a horse with blinders, and I would go after the thing because if I looked at anything else, I'd get hurt. And that's sort of the way I took care of myself mm. as a gay kid. So I, all through my twenties, I mean, it feels if you could watch my twenties, it's sort of like going through an old VCR and fast forwarding because that's the way it felt. That's all it was about for me. It was, you know, it wasn't about relationships, wasn't about anything other than the career. And then as I got in my 30s, I started becoming more, um, I guess, more self-reflective, more wanting to have a better life, more wanting to do something for somebody. Like I said, God, I got to do something. I want to go read to old people or something. And I thought, oh my God, I have an old person, my grandmother. So I started taking care of her and I started saying I was going to be the person for her. I was going to be the person mm -hmm. she could count on. And I was until she died at 96. So things like that became important to me in my life. Well, I guess that's what I'm referring to as empathy. You, you reached outside yourself, and despite the fact that your, your humor is about yourself to a great extent, it's observational humor. I mean, you're looking, I guess so, yeah. you're looking at you know, how you are re relating to that whole universe around you, and, uh, and you're viewing yourself in context. Which is fascinating. Now I just repeat things my mother says. And everybody, well, like she, I called her on the phone and I said, Ma, funny. I met this really great guy. I said, Ma, I met this really great, great guy. I'm, I'm talking, this is a phone from the 70s, you know, with a long cord. Of course. I said, Ma, I, I met this really great guy. And she goes, Is he gay? I said, Of course he's gay. No, he's a leprechaun, you know. She goes, I forgot, you know. <laughs> I mean, I just repeat things she says and people laugh. So that's what I That's, that's what a good I start. Anyway. Yeah. So how did the career start? How did the, the um, work start? I, I never, it never was really a start. I, I started acting in school plays. I started studying acting at a very young age. I was 14. Okay. I started pursuing my career when I was 19. I got my first job on a show called Life and Times of Eddie Roberts. Mm -hmm. And I played a pot-smoking, kind of Sean Penn character from Fast Bo Times at Ridgemont High character. And I guest starred on that show and I thought, this is it. I have made it. But how did that job? It didn't. I didn't work for years after that. The next part I played was in a movie called uh, The Lost Emperor with Robert Tessier from The Longest Yard and I played gay dude number one. And Jim Minarski directed it. And I remember, I'll never forget, I was so excited to be in a movie and my manager at the time got me the part. It was one line. The line was, give me back my purse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was so, you know, I wanted to be in a movie, I didn't care. And of course, I was playing the part of a gay person in this, in this movie. And I remember, he said, wear a flamboyant shirt, I'll never forget this. And I got on the set, he didn't think my shirt was gay enough. And he wanted me to wear an ascot. And I talked him out of that. And, I'm, and he said, oh, the shirt's just, it's, it's just not gay enough. And then he saw the makeup woman, he said, oh, you, come over here. And I wound up wearing the makeup woman's shirt that was two sizes too small. I look like Philip Seymour Hoffman in Boogie Nights. I did this oh, day, I've never grief. seen it. I've never been able to watch it. 
it was awful. It was an awful experience for a first time in a movie, and it was the beginnings of learning how to take a situation that was negative and turn it into a positive. And what I did is a, it was a first movie credit. No one ever saw the movie. It was a big bomb. You know, Robert Tessier's eyebrows kept changing, you know, through the whole film. They couldn't seem to be consistent with putting on these weird eyebrows. And I was like this. And um, it, it, it taught me how to take a character and bring depth and uh, uh, change to it, okay. you know, and, and to say, okay, this is a gay character, so this is something flamboyant. How can I make it interesting? How can I take this scene and have a beginning, middle, and end? Have this guy have a real life? Like that's even if I'm one scene in a movie. To me, it's about me. I'm the star of that movie in my mind. It's all a movie about this one guy and how, what's going on with him. And sometimes I, I hate to say it because the director Quentin Lee is here, a producer from other films. I just did a film for him called Big Gay Love. And to me, the movie was about this gay couple that comes to this house and is in this bad relationship. And they, the, the husband made him uh, adopt this kid, and he didn't really want the kid. But it doesn't say that in the script, but I just made that up, that I didn't want the kid. It makes me crazy. He cries. He talks. I'm locked in. I'm like some housewife locked. I'm like Beth from Mad Men. I hate my kids. You know? Yes. And I just create this idea of, of giving a character a whole life and subtext. And that's what I've learned to do as a, as a character actor and as a gay man, because in, a lot of times your parts aren't big and they, they don't have a lot of stuff going on. But I've been known to do that and, that, and it's fun for me. How did you make a living then if the acting parts did not come um, on the, a in, When basis? I was in the 20s, they didn't come at all. I could not get arrested. Could not get arrested. Every, every year I would do some part in something. And I remember I did my first big part in a film called Kindergarten Cop with Arnold Schwarzenegger and I played the hairdresser to the villainous. And I remember um, this, I had been an actor around 10 years and I remember uh, I was working with Carol Baker. Now I was really much more excited to work with Carol Baker than I was with Arnold Schwarzenegger. She had done Baby Doll and was nominated for that. She was Harlow. She, of course. she had done these great movies, The Carpetbaggers. You know, she was this yes. brilliant, and she's also a wonderful actress. And I had to play her hairdresser and I had to actually do her hair. And she didn't want anybody touching her hair, especially some guys she didn't know. And I thought I was fat, and every time I see that movie, I look so thin. Because um, there's a scene where you can see her, and you don't see my head, and you just see my, uh, I'm thinking, God, I wish I could go back to, that, to being that age again. And anyway, so she had lost her reading glasses. So we were shooting in a mall. So I found her reading, a place where she could buy these reading glasses. We were fast friends. I was invited to the trailer. She let me do anything I wanted to her hair. We improv around the stuff. They used most of the lines I improv and I started to realize that that is my gift, is, is making people comfortable in a, in, as a supporting actor. And that's what a supporting actor does, I think, is that a character actor, we are there to move the story along. Like I just did a film with Sally Kirkland, who everybody knows from being nominated for an Oscar for Anna. Yes. And she plays this woman, it's called Posey, and it was a part that was written for me by uh, Billy D'Amata, who's a casting director who I've known forever. Sure. And I think he had something to do with me getting Kindergarten Cop. I think he was an intern or an assistant in the office. I can't remember because I'm so old. But he wrote this part for me. And it, wasn't, it was a part where basically I play the manager again. I play that all the time. Of this rehab center where people, she has Alzheimer's and she's wonderful in the film. And she plays this woman who has Alzheimer's and she's supposed to come to this place and I help her. And, I, and the lines are almost all the same in all the scenes. And I thought, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make this work? It's the same thing. And I'm like in 10 scenes saying the same thing. So I just, when I got to the set, you know, I finally realized, ah, oh, it's Sally Kirkland. I've known Sally forever. Since I was a kid, since I saw her do in the Boom Boom Room, naked at the actor's studio when I was 19. <laughs> I thought, I know her. I'm just, and she's a, she's a star. I'm going to treat her like she's a star. I'm going to do, I'm going to make her laugh. I'm going to... I'm going to be sympathetic, I'm going to hold her hand, I'm going to you know, give her, her her due, and that's the way the part does. And when I went to all these film festivals and saw people who saw the film, I realized something that, that I had not seen in my work as I've gotten older, is that it's on you. It's so on you when you get older. You don't have to do as much. And I was just being of service to Sally Kirkland. And that's how I played the part. It was great fun. Well, I think uh, you're right. Young actors tend to put too much into it, too much activity, and part of acting is just being and being authentic and but being, with purpose. being of service. With purpose. It's important to have purpose and action. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, for me. Always in a scene. What am I doing? Why am I here? What is this about? You know, even as a stand-up, I come from an actor's point of view, so when I do an audience, people always say, you sound like you're just talking. 
And I say, because I want to make these people in the audience feel like this show is just for them. You know, that this is just about the experience that we're having tonight. And that's more fun for me. And it's more fun for the audience, I think. How did stand-up evolve for you? How did that come about? I had about? a manager and when I was in my 20s who said that I, or really early, when, that I should, really early 20s, that I should do stand-up that I'm funny. And everybody felt that I was such a nut. People told me, you can't do this. You're just too crazy. You're too unfocused. You're too like, because I was kooky. I think that I thought that I was Marlo Thomas on that girl. I think that because I, that's the only thing I'd seen about actors in New York, or that I was, you know, or that movie with um, uh, Elaine May and Alan Arkin. Oh, God, what was it called? I wish someone, do you, does anybody remember? I, I can't remember. There was a movie, and it was in the 60s, and this guy played an actor. It was Alan Arkin, who I would love to have the career of. He's somebody that I just adore. And I, that's the only thing I saw, so I didn't know. Even when I started doing stand-up, I thought I was playing a character, and I did that for 10 years. I used to wear zebra pants and a leopard jacket, and I'd spike up my hair and dance in a circle because I didn't want anybody to know I was gay. I was like crazy. So what I learned in stand-up, it took me around three years to sort of get focused. And then I became the first comedian to teach comedy driving school, and that was my first bit of fame. And then I got on Star Search, and I got on Merv Griffin, and uh, I did another 10 years of doing clubs, and all of a sudden I was making money and coming back to do a film or a TV show once a year and some stand-up show or something. And then all of a sudden, uh, I wasn't able to move up to being a headliner because I didn't have a point of view. I was just a joke. I was a funny visual joke because of my weird costumes and stuff. And that could go for a while, but all of a sudden I couldn't move artistically to the next level because I wasn't really being me. So in the early 90s, um, I started getting really depressed and I didn't want to, I, I even thought of going to New York and pretending I was someone else and talking like this and changing my name. I really thought about doing that. I was so crazy. But what I did is I decided to come out. I came out on the Geraldo show. It was 1993. Jason Stewart targets the homosexual community in his act. And uh, Jason, I understand that there's something that you've wanted to say for a very long time. Are you going to do it right here on my show? I'm coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is it, guys. I'm coming out. I've been, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gay. Okay, deal with it. Uh, no, I am. I, uh, oh, God, now we're here. It's TV. Stop this. No. And I decided I was going to do this on your show when they called. Um, I've been working on my act and coming out and experimenting for the last year or so. I'm also an actor, so that's my big fear, is that I won't be able to be able to play different parts. People will judge me and only want me to play one thing. And I mean, I wouldn't mind playing gay people if there were great gay parts. What am I going to do, wait for that great hairdresser role? <laughs> he laughs, he cries, he teases your hair. <laughs> but it was so um, interestingly weird. We were talked about almost like we were science projects. Yes. You know, and uh, did you watch that? The, the, I, I, yeah. I, I did watch it. It was yes. so interesting, and because I, I hadn't seen it in so long, and people would... And what was really interesting about me is I was quite articulate, I thought, for someone who had never done this before, so I think that I had thought about it a lot. But I was, inside, I was frightened. I was, I remember mm. I got sick that day, I couldn't breathe, you know. You did and, not look frightened. Oh, I was completely, my voice was, uh, you know, uh, I could I, I can tell you know yes. and uh, I remember Geraldo asked me something and I he said you're gonna come out today and I was just I, I was completely flustered and um, I remember I, I had lost myself for a moment I would like to know this young man what inspired him to come out of the cloud and let the people know what he's all about Jason why uh, why are you leaping into the open here first reason is for myself so as I so as I can have self-respect be who I am be able to have the same rights as everybody here in this room that's the first reason. Second reason is because I think there's a lot of kids out there. When I was growing up, there was nobody on television. There was no, there was no Geraldo show. There was no Joan, Oprah, Phil, all those shows. You didn't have gay people on TV. I didn't know who I was. I didn't, I, I just, what all I knew were the bad things, the things that people would say were negative. And, you know, maybe there's one kid out there right now that's not going to kill himself. Maybe there's one kid that's not going to feel depressed forever. Maybe there's one kid that won't feel like he's alone. And it's my way of doing service as a person. Will it affect your humor? Um, it already has in the last year, yeah. Writing and being yourself is so much easier. Do you know, can you tell us a gay joke? Right, you'll see the set. Don't push okay. me, Geraldo. <laughs> hi, hi. How did that come about? How did that... Um, I decided we sent out a press release from a fax machine in my apartment on Hudson Avenue and uh, sent it to all the top shows and a couple called and Geraldo was the biggest at the time. It was when he had uh, taken the chair, I guess, and got, it got hit, hit him on the head by the 
uh, skinheads or something. His show was so popular. He was, it was yeah. I think it was Phil, Oprah, uh, Geraldo. I think at that time, I think, you know, those were the popular. Phil was the biggest, you know. And it was either Oprah or Geraldo that were back and forth and who was bigger at that time, which is hard to believe, isn't it? It was 93. He was a big deal at that point. It really show. was. It was when everybody watched a TV show at once. You know, yes. it, was, it was sort of the end of that era. And then I started doing sitcoms. And then Ellen came out. And everything changed. Hmm. I mean, everything. It was like night and day. It was all of a sudden it was okay to be a gay person on TV. And they were, you were able to play small parts. Drew Carey, who was an old friend of mine, called me one day and said, hey, there's a part on my show, The Drew Carey Show, and uh, we want you to play the manager of this appliance department. And I got my first guest starring part since the first job I did when I was a kid. And it changed everything for me. And then I went on doing a lot of sitcoms with other comedian friends and stuff. And then Damon Wayans and my friend Bruce Fine, who was a writer on My Wife and Kids, had given me a call. I remember where I was exactly. I was at the Russian River. I was doing a show for some uh, gay bears. Those are the big guys. And uh, I remember I got a call from my agent in, in my hotel room because we didn't have cell phones then. It was 2000. And they said they want you to come in for My Wife and Kids to play the shrink on the show, the gay shrink. Everybody in the room said, who should we get for this part on My Wife and Kids? Everybody said Jason Stewart. I hung up the phone, started to cry, and called my agent back. I said, I don't understand anything you said, please repeat it. And <laughs> she told me that I had the part, because I thought I was going to have to go in. And I got the part, and it was one of those things, I played Dr. Thomas for uh, three or four episodes on that show. It was like everything came together for me. Funny, um, gay, sitcom, everything. I thought that was going to be it, you know. And then it sitcoms stopped after a while. And then I started doing um, a lot of indie films. And I did a film called Ten Attitudes that I produced that was completely improvised. And um, I, it was about how hard it was to fall in love. It was sort of my life. And I thought that film would do it. And it did very well. And it was one of the first. It was before Curb Your Enthusiasm and everybody was improvising. And that really got me into the, uh, the independent film stuff. And yes. then I started to do a lot of other films. And then I did Coffee Date. And I got nominated for Best Supporting Actor for the Gay International Film Award. And I started to do all these gay movies. And, all, and, then, the, and then because I was so popular in those, the straight people just came in even bigger. And I did tons of them. And... Uh, I guess it, that probably brought me to guest starring on The Closer, and that was a complete game changer for me. I had known this guy, Adam Belanoff, for years, who was a writer-producer on the show. He'd worked in sitcoms, yes, and he couldn't, he couldn't get arrested for a while after the sitcoms ended because everybody was known as a sitcom writer, and we kept in touch, and I called him. I said, hey, there's this part on the show. Do you think I could come in? It was a manager of a uh, storage facility. Now, yes. I, I played managers in everything. And when I went in, he got me the audition. Everybody there looked like this, you know, blue collar guy with the big bellies and the, they were all bald and looked, you know, these straight guys. And I didn't know what to do. I thought, you know, I felt like Barbara Streisand in, in Funny Girl when she had to sing, I'm the beautiful reflection of my love's affection. You know, and then she stuck the pillar under her, her thing and she goes on stage and sings that. I thought, what am I going to do? So the casting director comes over to me and says, they can't find anybody today. They're unhappy with everything. Do something. Well, if somebody gives me permission to do something and be creative, I decided I'm just going to talk like this. I'm going to talk like this, and I'll be this kind of tough guy who's annoyed. And I play this guy who finds a storage, uh, who finds a dead body in a storage facility. Right. And I decided to do it like somebody who was a little, you know, self involved. And he's been sitting in that facility for a long time and <laughs> didn't know, you know, that he was being accused of being the murderer. And then when they do it, he just sort of laughs at them. And it doesn't say that in script, so I play completely against it. And I got the part, and it changed everything. And I got a lot of uh, other parts and things playing annoying Jews because of that, <laughs> which I already was before. <laughs> you, you were able to segue nicely. Yes, into the... from, uh, from uh, you know, funny gay guy to, uh, you know, uh, uh, annoying Jew, you know. As um, a humorist, as a comedian, how much of what you do is uh, improvised and how much is scripted? Well, I stopped writing things down around 28 years ago. Okay. I used to write it out like a, you know, like a, a journal and I would write everything out. And then I realized that isn't the way I do it. So I bring an idea, I put something on the stage, I say, guilt trip. So my mom calls me on the phone and she says, 
I want to go see Barbara Streisand in The Guilt Trip. Come to Palm Springs and take me. I take her. And in the movie, she says, do I act like that? I said, no, Mom, not at all. You're worse. A <laughs> hundred times. <laughs> so that's that's how that happens. So that's what's in my head. I don't write it down. So that's something that you can Exactly. Then, I read pop. in the paper that only 1% of this country is gay. If that's true, I've slept with everyone. <laughs> I just read it. You know, you know, I, you know, you just see something and you go, that's, on the, my, one of the funniest jokes I ever uh, wrote was on stage because I was so mad about this gay marriage thing. I said, you know, I said, come on straight people. If you let us marry each other, we'll stop marrying you. And I said that because I was mad, you know. But it still was funny. All right, like I you. watched the movie, This is the End with Seth Rogen and they killed Rihanna. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> she falls in a hole, you know. All these straight guys are there in the movie, and they're all one. And, 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 the, and the monsters all have these large penises, and they're supposed to be straight. I don't understand straight people, you know. And that's what I'm going to talk about on stage next week. So that's the way, I, you know. And I'll just bring it up, and then I'll refine it, you know. And I'll, and I'll make mm -hmm. it my own. Most of your parts have been uh, character parts rather than leading man parts. Oh, almost all of them. I've only been a leading man once, and that was in a film that I made. I don't think I don't really want to be a leading man. That's not who I, know, I am. I think you could be though. I oh think, no! I, th I think I think. Why, Steve, don't why say do you... don't say that to me because I know who you are and I know where your house is now. <laughs> you know, I don't honestly. I don't really want to be a leading man. I'm a character actor, and that's what I want to be, and that's where I think I belong. I want to do. I mean, once in a while, there might be some role in something that is that, but I think that that's who I am. I want to have. I want to, you know, have a career in the vein of Philip Seymour Hoffman and Steve Buscemi and Ellen Arkin and mm -hmm. all those great guys that I just have loved. Burgess Meredith, you know, Paul Savino, all the people that I, that's the career. And even the women, you know, I, the character actors, I love them. Geraldine Page, Lee Grant, Whoopi Goldberg, all of them. That's where I want, that's what I want to do. And I want to continue to do that and work with talented people. Interestingly enough, though, those parts can segue into, if not leading man parts, extended parts and you know with the work you've done and the talent you have I would not be surprised if you end up with something that kind of carries a, a good part of a picture. I will. I'll be very surprised. <laughs> well I will not be because uh, I've, I've seen a lot of your work now and uh, you know what you're doing. You, you may be fearful sometimes and concerned about I think about you always it. are. I think if you lose that fear and that, that sort of um, if you take yourself too uh, seriously or you take yourself you know, you think I can do, you know, I'm always, I, I, I never know. You know, like there, th those two movies, Holy Land and Pit and the Pendulum, I did not know what I was going to do until I got to the set. I couldn't figure out the character. You know, I didn't know who they mm -hmm. were because a lot of times you don't get to talk to people or meet with them. It's not like, you know, Joaquin uh, Phoenix and, you know, I'm, and he's meeting with the director and they're all having these meetings and they all discuss right. things. I mean, do you remember that story about Sharon Stone doing Casino and De Niro and uh, is sitting and talking with them? It, you know, the director, Scorsese, and Sharon says, I want to be in there too. You know, I want to be a part of this. They were treating her like she was a movie star instead of treating her like she was an actor. And I think we all want to be a part of the process. I mean, if you don't like the process, you're not going to like being famous or being successful. Because all that really doesn't matter if you don't like the process, because that's what you're doing most of the time. If you don't like going on the set, you don't understand that is. Kids are always emailing me or calling me and saying, hey, I want to be an actor, I want to be this. One, I tell the story a lot. When some kid uh, called me and said, hey, I want to be a comedian, you're so funny. You know, what advice do you have for me? I said, who do you want to make laugh? He said, everybody. I said, oh, honey, have you met everybody? Because I have. And some of them are awful. <laughs> you don't want to make everybody. You want to find out who is your audience. Yes. Because it doesn't work like that anymore. You know, and it, kids, I said, I want to be an actor. I said, have you ever been on a set? Have you ever done a movie? I have one kid, this uh, uh, Robbie Carlisle, that I had met from the LifeWorks Project that I've been mentoring. Our mentorship stopped a year ago, but, we're, but I'm still mentoring him. And I said, go do some extra work. Get on a set. He's from Arkansas or Alabama or one of those A places where everybody eats until they, you know, explode. <laughs> and It's he, true. <laughs> he gets it. He's a big kid, and he got a job on uh, Seth Rogen's film for eight weeks playing the fat kid in a, a fraternity film. And he's wearing boxer shorts and a midriff. And he's in the film and he's hysterically funny. He's an extra, a featured extra. That film is going to change his career. And I said, get on there, get on a set. See if you like it. Because you might not like it. Yeah. it. It's not like, you know, I, I did another film, American Bistro, and the father was the producer of the film. 
and he was and his son is 22 and he's a director and he's yelling at him or 21 I couldn't believe it and he said I, I, the father was acting like the whole film should be shot in two hours you know he said why is this taking so long because it's an art you know we're not we're not you know just showing doing the movie filming it like it's a play and I think that's what he thought so a famous doctor or something who'd given the money for the movie yeah and you just never know uh, what the process is until you get there and you have to enjoy that I think you have to be okay with the work. Oh yeah, definitely. It, it, is, it is really not easy for anyone. Because I, I think a lot of people see what's in front of the camera and they don't realize that may not be what they want to do. I don't think for me when I first started I understood it at all because I think I wanted mm -hmm. to be famous because I was such a hated kid for being gay. You know, I was treated so badly that I wanted people to like me and I wanted to be funny. If you don't really love it enough that you're willing to you know, give up so much of yourself and you really do give up a lot of yourself. Yes. I mean, like now, I'm, you know, I actually say no once in a while, which I never used to do, you know, because uh, it's got to be something that's fun that I want to do, unless there's a, a lot of money, and then I say yes. Of course. You have been so focused on your career. Has it given you any chance for much of a personal life and an opportunity to be as social as you might like to be? Uh, I'm not a big social guy. I have a couple really close friends. My social stuff usually has to do with work. So I'm more, uh, my, the kind of fun that I like is a more one-on-one -on -one thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, that's, it, I have to say that's been a harder thing in my life. You know, I'm single again. I had a date for New Year's Eve. I'm still waiting for him to call me. Um, he said he's going to take me someplace nice, so, you know. Uh, dating is, you know, I, I have been in a relationship for a long time, but I'm ready. I'm ready, so if there's anybody out there, call me. <laughs> Well, um, I want a guy who has a car and has a job and doesn't live in the car. These seem like reasonable criteria. Oh, not in this town, honey. <laughs> Is there uh, some advice or counsel you can give to young people who aspire well, to do some of the I same things? I wouldn't say it's just young done? people, I say it's to everybody. Okay. Because they always say just young people. And you go across the country and then you see this guy like Jason Collins, who's in his early 30s, who didn't even tell his twin brother that he was gay. Yes. You know, so you see that it's not just about somebody who's a kid. It's, you know, it's, it's that 75-year-old gay guy that lives alone that's now, you know, retired and, and has been closeted his whole life and has yes. just a few close friends. It's about the idea that being out and booing, I've been in all areas. I've been totally in the closet. I was in the middle and, now I, and I've been completely out. There's nothing to compare to to be out. And I always say that whatever your job is or whatever you do in your profession, it's more important to be who you are and to be out than to be anything. And when I, you know, in 1992, 93, when I came out uh, publicly, I thought well, it's more important for me to be an openly gay man than it is for me to be in show business. And that was my dream forever. Yes. So I was willing to give up everything, you know, and go on this journey and whatever would happen would happen, you know. Well. Thank you so much for oh, doing thank this. thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Wow! <laughs> so I read in the paper the other day that only 1% of this country is gay, and if that's true, I slept with everyone. <laughs> and you know who you are. <laughs> so are there any straight people here? Where are the straight people? Yeah. Don't push it. Um, I love straight people, I really do. I have two that clean my house. You're nice people. <laughs> One of them stole something, but I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Is it weren't for you people? <laughs> we wouldn't be here. <laughs> you guys are popping us out. Ooh, Pop-Tarts. <laughs> Ooh, this one has frosting. 